In this video, I want to talk about the very simple concept behind the formation of the Corda Equina. Now, the Corda Equina, remember, is a bundle of dorsal and ventral roots filling much of the vertebral canal at the lumbar and sacral levels. The Corda Equina is not made up of spinal nerves, it's not made up of spinal cord tracts, it is made up of dorsal and ventral roots. So let's start off by doing a very, very simple diagram of um, a, a fetus, a young fetus, where the spinal cord is filling the entirety of the vertebral canal. So here is our spinal cord, here. And I'm going to draw on just some squares representing the vertebrae. OK, so I'm not trying to make this particularly anatomically accurate, but I just want to show you the concepts which are relevant. So here are some vertebrae, all right? And remember that um, connected to each chord segment is a pair of roots, one, um, a pair on the left and a pair on the right, and I'm just going to use a single line to represent both of these because we don't need to add any more um, in order to understand the concepts. So this line represents both dorsal and ventral roots coalescing together to form our spinal nerves, which emerge from the spine to supply various muscles. Now, I want you to think of these dorsal and ventral roots once they come together. Remember that we've got the dorsal root ganglion there, so the DRG is sitting here at about the level of the intervertebral foramina. And I want you to just think that the um, DRG represents a site of tethering of the roots to the spine. So the DRG can't move. At that point, uh, the roots and the resulting spinal nerve are tethered to the spine. So what's going to happen? Well, the spinal cord is going to grow a little bit. So the spinal cord is going to get a little bit longer. But the vertebral column is going to grow a lot, all right? And I'm representing that by this big arrow here. All right. So the vertebral column is going to grow massively, um, particularly at the lumbar levels, which take so much weight. But the spinal cord is only going to grow a little bit. And the result of that is going to be a situation looking like this. If the vertebral bodies have enlarged, but the cord has remained the same length, so we're going to zoom out slightly just so I can fit all of this in, but here is our spinal cord here, all right? and here are our um, vertebrae, and remember we said that their bodies have grown hugely. The consequence of that is that these um, roots which emerged from the spinal cord and originally had a one-to-one -one correspondence between cord segments and vertebrae, now have become stretched. Like this. Okay. They're still tethered at the point of the dorsal root ganglia within the intervertebral foramina, but because the spine has grown much faster than the spinal cord, it has stretched all these roots down to form the corda equina. And that is the fundamental concept behind this. And just remember to put one or two numbers on this. Once we get to an adult size, the spinal cord ends at around about the L1 vertebra. All right? So this is about L1, and the levels below L1 only contain cord or equina. They don't have spinal cord. And that's what makes those levels safer to do lumbar puncture than the, than the levels of L1 and above. So that's the formation of the cord requiner, the very basic fundamental concept. But before we leave, I just want to, do, to talk about one more thing. And, and this, once again, talking about the growth of the vertebral column, but I want to talk about that with reference to the um, development of hydrocephalus in uh, spina bifida. <clears throat> and you might think that that's a little bit surprising that there's a relationship between those, but there is. So let's draw um, just a very simple um, cartoonish representation of our 
central nervous system just here like this all right and of course within that central nervous system we have our our ventricular system which i'm not going to attempt to draw in too much um detail but remember you know it's got a third ventricle and a fourth ventricle and then a central canal etc okay now in spina bifida um, what can and it depends upon the type of spina bifida but what can happen in spina bifida is that the um, spinal cord the developing spinal cord can become adherent to the vertebrae or the overlying tissues that have failed to develop normally so this here might represent a point of adhesion between the developing spinal cord and the abnormally developed vertebral column if we have a point of adhesion um, between the cord and the vertebral column when this process of growth in the vertebral column kicks off what can happen is it can pull the spinal cord down okay this is relative movement of course you know it's not pulling it down is it the whole thing is growing but the result is as if it had been pulled down if you pull the spinal cord down well of course foramen magnum is still going to be at this point here all right so this is foramen magnum here with this the c1 vertebra below and if you pull the spinal cord down you can slightly compress um, regions of the brainstem such as the fourth ventricle all right so we might have some compression at this level and if we have compression at the level of the fourth ventricle this can impair the drainage of csf out of the fourth ventricle and into the subarachnoid space and consequently within the ventricular system if the drainage is impaired the pressure can increase and we can get hydrocephalus so that's all I wanted to say there about the uh, relationship between the growth of the spine and the development of hydrocephalus in some children with spina bifida. Thank you for listening.